interruption. Thank you all for your cooperation, and uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Good afternoon. To acknowledge that we are gathered in Ottawa on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Thank you for joining me today to discuss the findings of three reports that my office released this morning. I will begin with our audit of professional services contracts. It looked at whether federal contracts awarded to McKinsey and Company between 2011 and 2023 complied with applicable policies and provided Canadians with value for money spent. These contracts spanned 20 federal organizations, including 10 Crown Corporations. The total value of contracts awarded to McKinsey and Company during the period we reviewed totaled $209 million, of which about $200 million was spent. We found that organizations awarding the contracts showed a frequent disregard for federal contracting and procurement policies and guidance. We also found that each organization's own practices often did not demonstrate value for money. The extent of non-compliance and risks to value for money varied across organizations. For example, in 10 of the 28 contracts that were awarded through a competitive process, we found that bid evaluations did not include enough information to support the selection of McKinsey and Company as the winning bidder. Awarded to McKinsey and Company, it highlights basic requirements and good practices that all federal organizations should follow when procuring professional services on behalf of the Government of Canada. Federal contracting and procurement pol policies exist to ensure fairness and transparency and value for Canadians, but they only work if they are followed. Turning now to our audit of Sustainable Development Technology Canada, <clears throat> which looked at whether the Foundation managed public funds in accordance with the terms and conditions of contribution agreements and its legislative mandate. We also looked at Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada's oversight and administration of public funds. Between March 2017 and December 2023, the Foundation approved $856 million of funding to 420 projects. The audit found that there were significant lapses in Sustainable Development Technology Canada's governance and stewardship of public funds. Specifically, the Foundation awarded $59 million to 10 projects that did not meet key requirements set out in the contribution agreements between the government and the Foundation. These projects were ineligible for funding because, for example, they did not support the development or demonstration of a new technology or the projected environmental benefits were overstated. <clears throat> I am also very concerned by breakdowns in the Foundation's governance. We found that these organizations have neither the capacity nor the tools to effectively fight cybercrime as cyber attacks grow in number and sophistication. Part of the issue is the federal government's siloed and disconnected approach. We found breakdowns in response, coordination, tracking and information sharing between and across federal organizations. In addition, given the links between spam and cybercrime, the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission's narrow view of its role has limited the extent to which it helps protect Canadians. Effectively addressing cybercrime relies on incident reports going to the organizations best equipped to receive them and on those organizations acting on those reports. The current system for reporting cyber incidents is confusing and it does not meet the needs of individuals reporting these crimes. Communication Security Establishment Canada and Public Safety Canada have discussed implementing a much needed single point for Canadians to report cybercrime. This has yet to happen. We also found that the RCMP struggled to staff its cybercrime investigative teams. We estimated that as of January 2024, close to one third of positions across all teams were vacant. 
in our view, having a plan to reduce human resource gaps across all organizations involved in fighting cybercrime, including the RCMP, is an important component of a national cyber security strategy. The takeaway from these reports is that when good governance is lacking, the remedy isn't necessarily new processes or more people or money. It's about applying the rules that exist and having the right people with the right expertise for the job. Merci, thank you. Je suis maintenant prête. I'm ready to answer your questions now. <coughs> thank you so much. We will start questions in the room. Again, one question, one follow, and we'll start with David Reedley from The Logic. Thank you. Um, my questions are about the cybercrime audit. The uh, reports that the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity uh, did nothing with, did they tell your team why they didn't respond to reports that came in via the web form? Um, so I think when, whenever we encountered this in some of the organizations, not just um, in, in C6 involvement, it, it was a few things usually. One, either that they just didn't have the resources uh, to respond or that there were privacy reasons for which they didn't forward along um, the information. In this case, it was quite unique. It was just the online ones where they didn't get back to individuals. But I think it points to the, the bigger concern that without this lack of this, this one point of reporting cybercrime and then letting the federal public service figure out who should better handle the reports that come in, uh, Canadians are going to find it confusing and probably frustrating that they don't know what's happened to a report that they've made. The need for a, a one, sort of one window, one reporting location, that seems a little bit at odds with your concluding statement that uh, if people just followed the rules and the, the right people were in the right spot, many of these problems could be solved. It sounds like you're calling for structural reform when it comes to dealing with cybercrime. Is that right? Well, I think that this is something that even the organizations involved in fighting cybercrime know is needed. They just haven't implemented it. Um, you don't need that in order to agree that if a report that comes to you now is not within your mandate, that you should do something about it. Um, so even just better coordination and not being so siloed um, could, could help improve this situation without the, the one-stop shop for folks to to, to report in a, a cybercrime. Uh, next, we'll turn to Daniel Leblanc from Radio Canada. I have a question about. Uh, I said we know that this is a special investigation that was not necessarily in your investigation plans. What triggered it? Why did the did the minister ask for this, or did someone else ask push you to do so? So, if we go back a bit in time, there is the at the foundation, allegations were made public tied to the management of public funds and human resources. We received these allegations and when we received them, we were at uh, the, we said there were a lot of people on the board who are appointed by governor and council appointee. Um, alors, um, le bureau du conseil privé a communiqué, uh, so the Privy, the Privy Council immediately communi communicated with ICED, which is the department that uh, oversees the foundation. So we followed what was happening closely. The department triggered an investigation, and following the investigation, recommendations were made to the foundation. Why did I decide to do an audit? It was the um, response by the foundation. The foundation did the bare minimum following the fact-finding mission conducted by a third party. I thought, I was concerned, and I thought that it was important for Canadians to know whether the funds uh, managed by this organization were, were well managed, and that's why I focused on it. What concerned you the most? Is it that some projects were ineligible? Was that that you were they were over assessing the impact? What was your biggest concern? You said conflict of interest. I understood that, but about the projects that were approved and the use of public funds, what was most worrisome? Answer: I would say two things. One is that there were funds issued when there were conflicts of interest, and in individual 
should not put themselves into um, a, a situation where there is an appearance of conflict or a real conflict of interest. So that's one of the concerns. The second is tied to the approvals. There's a very clear agreement between the federal government and the foundation on the process that needs to be followed. And a number of times the process was not followed properly and then that meant that there were 10 projects that were not eligible that should not have received funding. I would now expect the foundation and the government to decide whether they want to recover the funds or at least communicate with the organizations that are not admissible and they shouldn't have received the funding. CBC? Hi, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, this is about the professional services contracts. You say there don't need to be a new contracting rules. So what should the government do about existing rules to make sure that they're followed? Mm -hmm. That's a great question that I have been thinking about for the, this whole audit. What is it about the federal government's existing contracting policies and guidelines that are causing the behaviors that we're seeing here? And I really think the public service needs to, to give that some thought. Is it that the rules are so um, complex uh, that people try to go around them to make procurement faster? Or is it that there are so many rules that are complex that there's no way to know all of them and that you're accidentally forgetting or missing some of them? Um, I, I think it boils down to making sure that everyone's aware uh, of the procurement rules that are out there and the reasons why they should be followed. Um, they're there to ensure uh, transparency and accountability and good value for money, but they only work when they are followed. Um, and so, you know, is it need to be simpler or, or, or does it need to just be a good reminder? I think we should start with the reminder and not create more rules. And then to follow up, uh, this is specific to McKinsey, do you think the conf a perception of a conflict exists when Dominic Barton, the former uh, ambassador to China and one time chair of the Liberal government's economic advisory committee, also served as the global managing director of McKinsey and Company? So I think there's a, a, a theme through some of these reports around managing well conflict of interest and sometimes there are real, sometimes it's, it's apparent or perceived and all should be treated um, with, with equal importance. Um, I think here when we looked at all of these contracts, we didn't see any ministerial involvement or any uh, uh, th that would have directed contracts uh, to McKinsey and company. We did find that six uh, of the contracts um, the processes were sort of designed or, or uh, appeared to design to suit McKinsey or favor McKinsey. Um, but other than that, it was mostly a lack of properly justifying why um, issuing a non-competitive contract. Um, and, and that justification is so important because competitive procurement processes are, are usually, uh, should be the default and are, are there to ensure better value for Canadians. Good afternoon. I wanted to know. I see some similarities with the report on public services with the one you wrote about the ArriveCan program. What do you think about that? Is this a systemic problem? Answer. At the beginning, I thought I would say there. I, I would say there are two very different. Uh, situations. ArriveCAN was contract awarding for developing a software in a crisis. Here, the professional service contracts are are really daily contracts, which is a bit different. In ArriveCAN, there was a flagrant lack of a lot of rules, not just rules for contracting but proper management, budgetary management, bookkeeping. There were a lot of issues. Here what I would say is I have no reason to believe that the results are limited to McKinsey. I would expect that the rules are not followed in other cases as well, other uh, contracts or more generally speaking, in other contracts issued across government, and that's why a bit they need to take a better look at, at their rules 
for awarding contracts throughout the, f- the federal government, whether they're in Crown corporations or departments, because we've seen gaps across all federal uh, organizations. Minister Duclos has indicated that there's training that will be given in his department. It hasn't been completed yet. Is that is that enough, in your opinion, to address the fact that the rules have not been followed? Answer. I would expect that measures are already underway. We're the third office to in- investigate uh, contracts awarded to McKinsey. Training is a good start. There are a lot of public servants who work very hard in... Uh, in Crown corporations and departments to award uh, contracts, but there are a lot of rules and they're very complex. Training is needed. But better oversight of each federal entity is required to ensure that they comply with the rules because the rules are there to ensure that there is fairness and transparency and a good return on, on uh, public funds. The impress. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, I, I'm sure you know that um, a big part of the reason why the McKinsey contracts came into focus was this idea that the value in contracts kind of really increased under this current government. Um, given you looked at uh, contracts from 2011 to 2023, I'm wondering if there are any differences, uh, I guess, in practices that you saw, I guess, under the Harper government versus under the Trudeau government, or were these problems consistent throughout the years? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that that audit does cover a 12-year span, which is a really lengthy re- lengthy time, and uh, we saw non-compliance either with procurement rules or um, difficulty demonstrating value for money uh, throughout the whole 12-year period of time, and it was um, in in all almost all organizations. So it was nine out of ten departments and agencies that had issues with at least one contract and eight out of 10 crown corporations. So this is really, uh, uh, that, that, that's why I, I, I have the belief that it isn't limited to McKinsey. It is likely a bigger, uh, bigger issue of making sure that the rules are, are not forgotten and people are paying attention to them. Um, your one recommendation on conflict of interest, I'm wondering if you can explain a little why you gave that recommendation specifically and if it had anything to do with specific findings from the audits. Mm-hmm. Um, So I think it's important to note that we only issued one not because we wouldn't have issued more. Uh, We felt that it wasn't necessary to repeat recommendations that had just been issued by the procurement ombuds or by internal audit shops and the controller general who had released reports um, over the last year related related to McKinsey. Uh, Many of our recommendations would have been focused on uh, follow the existing rules. So um, we don't usually give that recommendation. But where we saw an opportunity to improve would be around being more proactive in conflicts of interest. And it wasn't because we found negative findings, but more that we saw such a varied um, practice across all of the federal entities. We saw some crown corporations who were doing a really good job at being very proactive whenever they enter into a procurement process. And we think it's important to, if you're gonna sit on a committee, to assess whether a competitive, who should win in a competitive process, you should take a few seconds to realize whether or not you have a conflict of interest. Just relying on the annual declaration that public servants do is not enough. Um, This, you know, uh, a competitive process is meant to have no bias and be fair and transparent. And this is just an extra uh, certification to make sure that everyone involved is um, operating with the best interests of the public service and the government of Canada at heart. Michel Sabat, La Presse Canadienne. Bonjour. Good afternoon. I'll follow up on the questions by my previous colleague. On your only recommendation, why did you stop? Are you simply ex- fed up? Answer, why did I just issue one recommendation? No, not, not because I'm discouraged or fed up. I think the rules are very clear, and I'm a bit confused about why they're not followed. When 
contracts are being awarded. And that's why I think the government needs to take a step back to say, what is causing this situation? Is it because there are too many rules? Or is there another reason that people are trying to get around the rules? And I think it's important to not pile too many rules on top of what already exists. I, I need to, it's, it's a reminder of the directives, and then there needs to be good oversight to ensure the rules are followed. You and your team discussed with Minister Duclos and a number of departments and organizations. Does your, do you get the impression that the federal government is investing signif sufficient effort to correct the gaps that you have identified? Answer. I think it will time, take time to see whether the measures are sufficient. My office for decades has been auditing contracts issued by governments, and we often make recommendations. But I'm a bit concerned that every recommendation and every audit, whether it's done by my office or another entity, that we are adding to the rules and that it becomes very difficult to ensure that all of the processes are, are indeed followed. I will wait a bit to see whether there's better oversight before I decide whether a more a broader audit on, uh, on contracting is necessary. But here, I think the public service has a lot to work with. Hill Times. Thank you. Um, the procurement ombudsman defined the favoritism seen uh, in the McKenzie contracts as below the surface favoritism compared to the ones in Arrive Can. Um, did you see any differences or similarities between the two, if at all? Um, so in Arrive Can, if you'll remember, we did see that um, a Canada Border Services Agency allowed uh, GC strategies to be involved in setting the, the selection criteria and that it was very limited and, and, and favored them and then they were ultimately awarded um, what was uh, a competitive contract. Uh, in this case, uh, we found six contracts where it appeared that the procurement process might have been designed to suit McKinsey or favor them, um, but it, it wasn't, um, they, they weren't involved in setting any of the selection criteria. Uh, so we saw some instances where two departments changed the procurement strategy. Not that you're not allowed to do that, but we didn't see a justification for why waiting to issue contracts to McKinsey. Um, we saw a couple of departments who um, waited over a year for the National Master Standing Offer to be issued with McKinsey so that they could give them a contract. So those really give you the appearance that you were waiting for an in, a, a specific company. What's missing and what's most important, and it's not just in those six contracts, um, but, but almost in more than half of the contracts that we looked at that were issued on a non-competitive basis, is that justification for why was either completely missing or really not uh, thorough enough. Um, and when you're going to go away from the norm, which should be to compete a contract and issue one in a non-competitive way, that justification is critical to show why this is the best use of taxpayer money. Quick follow-up. Um, what does the audit tell us about the government's reliance on professional contracts? Um, well, I think if you look in the audit, there's two charts where we look at uh, the total spend across the public service over this 12-year period on professional services contracts, and you see that it's definitely increasing. Um, over, over the, the time period. Um, McKinsey was a small portion of those expenditures, you know, 0.27% of what was spent was um, contracts given to McKinsey. Um, I, I think overall it points to the fact that that first step that I would expect to happen when a go uh, the government's going to enter into a contract isn't being well done and well documented. And it's an important step to, to show value for money. It's why do I need this contract? So what am I trying to fulfill? Is there a skill gap? Is there a capacity issue? What is it that I need? Do I need expert advice that may not reside in the public service? Or do I just want to try and be different? So I want to get different perspectives. Um, when that first step isn't done, then it's really hard to know whether the contract is needed in the first place. And, and then all the other justifications become so much more important. 
Um, I think as the, the government tries to transform itself and be different, getting external perspectives is important, but it's about making sure that you're not taking away um, from what the public service should be doing, that you're really trying to get a, a different point of view. We will now turn online. If you are online and have a question, please use the raised hand function. Uh, we'll start with Sandrine Vieira from Le Devoir. Oui, bonjour. Um, J'aimerais savoir si durant votre enquête, vous avez trouvé des preuves ou si vous avez raison de croire que Mackenzie a été en, en mesure d'influencer les politiques du gouvernement en matière d'immigration. Mm. So we saw a few contracts that were issued to Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, but we didn't really see that they were involved more than the expert advice that they had through their contracts. Thank you. No follow-up? No. Okay. Uh, seeing no additional questions online, we will bring this press conference to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you.